Hello everybody and welcome to this week's project. So what I've done this week is I bought another motherboard from eBay. This is how it's described here. Dell Attitude 3580 i5 7200U. Motherboard is faulty, not turning on. Price 49 euros. And this is the board here. So I didn't pay 49 for this. I bought a bunch of these and got them for 100 quid. But this is the first of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take pictures of this board, I'm going to get it onto the screen, and we're going to have a look at it together. I've scanned in the motherboard and this is what it looks like. So if I zoom in to 100% you'll see what level of detail we have on it. So it's pretty good and it should suffice for what we need. Now this is described as faulty and not powering on. So what should we start with? Well, I guess the first thing we should probably try and do is establish if there's a short anywhere on the board. Because if we had the standard Dell power adapter, we could just plug it in and what most likely will happen is that it will shut itself off if it sees a short. However, when I come to injecting with my own power supply, uh, I can set a current limit on it, but it won't actually shut off if it sees a short. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring you through the input section and just do a cursory check and see if there's any obvious shorts on this motherboard. So where do we start? Well, we start, as usual, at our DC in jack, and that jack is down here. So let's get a look at it and see what's going on. Now, we have an indication of pin 1 here. We have 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, so let's just mark those 6 pins here. Now, using a multimeter, we could probably work out which ones are ground and which ones are in, but I'm going to find a schematic and see if we can find out for sure what each of these pins does. On the left I have the schematic for this motherboard and that will tell us exactly what each of these pins are for. So as we can see we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. There's a 7 and 8 which correspond to these two pins on the outside and they're just two grounds so we can ignore them. But pin 1, let's start with pin 1. Pin 1 here is plus DC in and that joins with pin 2. So our main 19.5 volts or whatever it is for this board comes in here. So that's these two pins 1 and 2 here. Number 3 is, it's got an X beside it, so that's not connected. Next is pin 4. Pin 4, let's see where that goes. So we'll follow pin 4. We're following it up this path up here. And yes, that's the ID. So pin 4 is our ID signal. Uh, next we have pin 5 and 6. And I guess at this stage, by the process of elimination, we can assume those to be ground. And sure enough, they're grounds. So that's what each of the pins does. So what we want to check is, we want to check along the path of our DC in and see if we can find any shorts. Start with our first measurement of the DC input jack. So I'm going to introduce my multimeter in diode mode. And just to mark out that this is our DC in and this is our ground. Hopefully you saw them appearing. So DC in is pins 1 and 2 and ground is pins 5 and 6. So what we need to do is we need to place our red probe to our ground and place our black probe to our DC in. And when I did that, I got a measurement of 0 0.612. So we have no short at the input section. So where do we go next? It doesn't look like there's any other components uh, on this side of the board. Well, it looks like we have a couple of vias carrying the DC input through to another side of the board. So let's try and find where it goes. See if we can find out where that DC input goes next. Um, I actually have a schematic as I've shown you, so I really just need to look for the number of the component next. But if I didn't, how would I find out where that DC input goes? Because we have no indication. Well, what I tend to do in this scenario is to look for the current sense resistors because we know on the input there's usually an inductor, two MOSFETs and a current sense resistor. There's also a current sense resistor that can, uh, that's used to analyse the amount of current going to the battery but there's usually only those two and they usually have a similar format. So if I look here for example, I can spot one straight away. This is a current sense resistor right here, so that, that could be where our DC input goes. And I've also spotted that there is another one here. But if we look at this one here, what you can see is that this is the current sense resistor here. And back from that we have one MOSFET, and that connects to another MOSFET and then back to here. So what I suspect is that this is where our DC in goes. This is our first MOSFET, our second MOSFET, and a current sense resistor. You just need to get used to recognizing that pattern because it seems that pretty much all of the laptops that we've dealt with on this channel have that same 
um, that same configuration. So let's put this side by side with my schematic and verify that what I'm saying is correct. Okay, so I've introduced my schematic here again, so you might remember pins 1 and 2 are where we're connecting here. So let's follow along and see what the next component is in line. Well, what it's telling me here is it should be EL4301, EL4302, do not stuff. I don't know what that means. Somebody might explain that to me in the comments. But we should be looking for EL4301, EL4302. And if we look across at our actual board, you can see the markings for EL4301 and EL4302, but they are nowhere to be seen. Um, so I think they are maybe on some configurations of the board, but, but they're not on this one. So I'm just going to jump over those and assume that they're not present. So following along this line, we can see that we have a diode, a TVS diode. So PD4301, which corresponds to uh, this one right here. 4301. So this is our diode right here. So we know that this corresponds to our DC in. So at least we know we're in the right section. <laughs> so following along on that, coming along here, yeah, DC in. It's still called DC in at this point. And we come on to the source pins of PU4301. So PU4301, we can see the marking here, PU4301, and that corresponds to this here. So I was correct, this is where our DC input goes. So what we want to do here is we want to just check and see is there a short at this point. The multimeter once again in diode mode. I place my red probe to ground and I'm placing my black probe to the source pins of that first MOSFET. And what we measure there is 0 0.612. So there's no short at this point. Now we've checked up to the point of the first MOSFET and we have no short before this point. So next what I want to check is, I want to check between these two input MOSFETs and see if we have a short at this point. So once again with my red probe connected to ground in diode mode, I connect my black probe to the drain pin of the second MOSFET and I find that it measures 1.514. So there's no short here either. And the one last measurement I need to check here is to see if there's a short after the second MOSFET where the current sense resistor is here. So again in diode mode I place my black probe to this current sense resistor right here and what I measure is 0 0.001. So what does that mean? Well that means it looks like we once again have a short on our main power rail. Now this is actually good news because if you have a short on the main power rail this can usually be pretty easy to get resolved. We inject voltage at this point and see what component carries the current to the ground. That component will heat up and then we see what it is and remove it. So I'm going to show how I set up the voltage injection next. And just so everybody is clear where exactly I'm going to start injecting voltage, this is it on our schematic. So this is our second MOSFET and this is our current sense resistor PR4402. So right here is where I've detected 0 0.001 volts in diode mode and this is where I'm detecting that there is a short. So this is essentially our main power rail here and it's just after this current sense resistor where I'm going to inject. Now on to the fun part. Let's introduce our DC power supply and I'm going to start injecting with a very low voltage. So we'll start with 1 volt and 300 milliamps. Now it's not likely that anything is going to heat up with that, but we have the flexibility that we can bring the voltage and the current up and down as we wish. So how I connect it up is as follows. We connect the black wire to ground, and I'm connecting my red wire to where we detected that short, which is just after the current sense resistor. And that's where we start our injection. Now, with injecting this very small amount of power onto the board, nothing obviously heated up. So what I did was I slowly raised it up bit by bit, and what I found was that when I injected 4 volts, it drew a current of 1300 milliamps, and one section of the board began heating up. And I'm going to show you that on camera next. Now, when I injected 4 volts onto the board, it pulled 1300 milliamps, and this is the component that heated up on the right. Now, obviously, we can see now that we've zoomed in that it also pa it fails a visual inspection as well because it looks like it's cracked. But what I did just to prove it was douse it in flux and switch on some power again. So when I switch on the power you'll see immediately it starts to burn off the flux. So that is our shorted component. 
And just in case anybody's experiencing this fault themselves, the capacitor that I found to be shorted is the one on the same side as the DC in jack. It's actually just up from it here, and it's this one. Now, there's no marking on it, but hopefully there's enough in this that if you suspect you have the same fault, you can check this capacitor and maybe it's failed on yours as well. And this is a quick video of me removing that capacitor. Now, if you're curious as to why the capacitor is a small bit crooked, I forgot to record it the first time, so I put the capacitor back on the board to record a video of me removing it. But that is the crack capacitor there, as you can see. That's me removing it. Now, with the capacitor removed, we need to check and see do we still have a short. So now that my dodgy capacitor has been removed, we need to check at our current sense resistor and see if we're still measuring a short. So, I put my red probe onto ground, I put my black probe to where we measured previously at the current sense resistor and this time we measure 0 0.459 so it looks like our short is gone now that doesn't mean that you know the short is the only fault on this board but it's worth trying at this stage to power it on I don't have a power adapter for this so what I'm going to use is my DC power supply to provide 19.5 volts at the DC input jack and then I'm going to try and find a power button and see if we can power it on just in case anybody's curious as to how I hooked up my DC power supply to provide power to this board, I set my power supply to 19.5 volts. I connected my black wire to ground where it was before, and this time I connected to where the DC input is. So connecting my wire here is essentially the same as connecting it at the DC input jack because this is where the DC input jack comes to. So when I plugged it in there, it drew 0 0.011, that's 11 milliamps. So that seems about right for standby. So the next thing is to try and power it on. So I needed to work out how to power it on without the actual little daughter board that has the power button on it. And this is where our schematic comes in helpful once again. So I have PWR1, which is the power button as it's referenced on the schematic, and on our actual motherboard, PWR1. So this is the connection. As I said, I just have the motherboard. I don't have the little daughter board that plugs in here with the power button on it. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find out which of these pins is the one for the power button and then find some way of grounding it. So let's first of all identify the pins. So we've pins 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's mark those out. So pins 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's see what they do. Pin 1's got an X, so that's not connected. Pin 2 is KBC underscore power button. So this is the power button signal that's sent down to the KBC or Super IO or EC or whatever you want to call it, but that's how it's referenced here. So that's the one that we're interested in. Pin 3 is power LED, and pin 4 is connected to ground. We have pins 5 and 6, which correspond to uh, 5 and 6 here, which are just other grounds. So let's mark in what each of those are for. So 1, 2, 3 and 4, but 2 is the one of interest. So this is the power signal that's sent to the Super I.O. So I've measured this with my multimeter and there is 3 volts on it. So what we need to do is we need to somehow ground that and send that signal back to the Super I.O. So how do we do that? So to ground the power button signal, I got my tweezers and I brought it in very carefully and connected it to pin 2 and pin 4. So that jumpers pin 2 to ground and then I release it. So it's the same as you would press the power button. You would essentially just connect it and release. And that sends the signal to the Super I.O. to switch on. So I'm going to show how I did that in the real world and let's see if this motherboard comes on. So this is my setup on the real board. So I have my black wire connected to ground I've got my red wire connected to where my DC input is. And as you can see, I've set 19.5 volts on the power supply and it's drawing 11 milliamps. So what we're gonna try next is to power it on. This is the video of where I try and jumper the power switch on. Now, just before I do this, you might notice that the tweezers seems to hit off pin one a bit. Pin 1 is not connected, so I have the freedom that I don't really have to worry about hitting off this. Usually I would probably be a little bit more careful, but let's watch what happened when I jumpered pin 2 to pin 4 through my tweezers. Okay, so you can hear it starting to draw more current. It's now gone up to drawing 260 milliamps almost, 
and we have a display. I've plugged in an external screen and that's it. So we now have a booting motherboard after removing the short. So that's my video for this week guys. Please like and subscribe and I'll be back with something new next week.